Greetings everyone, I'm Navitha Roy and I'm Raghav Ramchandran. Today we'll be presenting you a presentation on the third law of motion provided by Sir Isaac Newton. We'll be ending with our project, Project Liftoff. And welcome to the presentation by the best team. God Raghav, you can't say that. Hmm, I think you're right. Well, they'll decide it in about 10 minutes. At least I got you to say I was right. Stop boring the audience. Fine then, let's start. Well, in our presentation, we'll be discussing about Newton, the great Sir Isaac Newton, the three laws of motion with special emphasis on the third law, and a few examples. Also, we'll be ending our presentation with a project liftoff. Let's start with a small introduction on Sir Isaac Newton and his wonderful mind. Don't forget the world-changing apple. Sir Isaac Newton was a world-renowned physicist, mathematician, alchemist. And a lot of other things. You know what? You're not doing him any justice by interrupting me. Not only did he formulate the three laws of motion, but he also gave a basis for the Kepler's laws of planetary motion, as well as defined the gravitational constant and defined the speed of sound and air. Imagine how smaller our science textbooks would be if Newton was found sitting under a coconut tree instead of an apple one. Anyway, the first law of motion states that a body at rest or at motion will remain at rest or motion until and unless compelled by another object to change its state of rest or state of motion. This is also called the law of inertia. The second law of motion states that an object with greater mass would require greater force to accelerate or force equals to mass into acceleration. And the third law of motion, the base of our presentation, states that to every action there is an equal and opposite reaction. You know what that law reminds me of? The philosophical idea of karma which states that everything you do will eventually and surely come back to you. An example of the third law of motion is the rowing of a boat. When one rows a boat, the oars push the water backward. This is called the action force. In turn, the water exerts an equal and opposite force on the boat, which compels it to move forward. This is the reaction. I'm sure you must have seen all seen the Avengers movie. When uh, Tony Stark puts on his suit, he's being able to fly. And I'm also sure you might wonder why. Well, after this presentation, you will be able to answer that question. Well, when an object, A, applies force F on an object B. This object B will apply an equal and opposite force on object A. This is the main principle of the third law of motion. The important points to remember here are the magnitude of both the forces would be the same. The direction of the forces would be opposing each other and they would be acting on different bodies. Thank God you didn't contradict me on the Avengers example. Be glad, I had good points to add. Another example can be the recoil of the gun. When a gun shoots a bullet, it applies a forward acceleration on the bullet. The bullet in turn applies a uh, backward force on the gun, which causes it to recoil. This is known as, this forms an action-reaction pair. Not to argue with the great Isaac Newton, he states that in the third law of motion, to every action there is an equal and opposite reaction. Then why doesn't the earth move to the moon? My god, what a chaotic world lies in your imagination. But never fear because the answer to your question is quite simple. For this, I will be referring to the second law of motion, which states that force equals to mass into acceleration. This means that acceleration equals to force by mass, or acceleration is inversely proportional to mass. This means that when a body has a greater mass, it, uh, the lesser it will accelerate. We all know that the Earth is, has a far greater mass than the Moon. Therefore, when even though the Moon applies a force on the Earth, the, moon, the Earth doesn't go whooshing towards the Moon. That actually makes sense. Well, you know what? This is very boring. These definitions are all very boring. Let's move on to the practical portion of our presentation. Good job with the alliteration. For this, we will be requiring an empty water bottle, a cork, a stand, and baking soda and vinegar. And, and the willingness to clean it up also. The willingness I will be required by you. What is the chemical composition that makes this rocket fly? Well, the chemical portion is quite simple. The baking soda reacts with the vinegar to form uh, sodium acetate water and carbon dioxide. The carbon dioxide which is under pressure propels the rocket upwards. Well, on the other hand, the physics part of this is also quite simple. When the acetic acid reacts with the baking soda as she told, it creates carbon dioxide. This carbon dioxide has immense pressure. Because of this pressure, there is an upward thrust or force that propels the bottle upward. Hence, the rocket is being able to fly. Come on, I need to things. I need to see things fly anyways. <laughs> All right, then let's begin with the practical portion of our demonstration. When the vinegar mixes with the uh, baking soda, there is um, 
the potential energy within the bottle. As soon as there is very high pressure within the bottle, the bottle experiences a kinetic energy because of which it moves up. When it reaches the highest point, after which it cannot go higher anymore, it reaches a form of potential energy. That's enough. Well, that was truly astounding. I think something got on my shirt. You and your problems. Mm, anyway, but that was a great ending to our presentation. Let's just hope everyone here thinks so too. Thank you so much for your time and consideration.